I'm extremely excited today because I am going to discuss with you a great poem by a great poet Sailing to Byzantium by William Butler Yeats. I would like to begin by observing that Ireland that Ireland has made a phenomenal contribution to English literature. Among the star contributors to English literature from Ireland are George Bernard Shaw, Jonathan Swift, Samuel Beckett, James Joyce, Oscar Wilde, and of course, W.B. Yeats. There is no doubt that W.B. Yeats is the greatest poet produced by Ireland the greatest Irish poet ever. Yeats is a great poet for reasons which are perfectly clear. His corpus, the corpus of Yeats, displays impressive quantity impressive quantity, consistent quality and remarkable variety. The collected poems of Yeats, as I am fond, as I am fond of pointing out, is several times bigger, is several times longer than the collected poems of, say, T.S. Eliot. Many poets, Wordsworth included, have written pages and pages of utterly unreadable verse. Not so in the case of W.B. Yeats. W.B. Yeats was a dedicated craftsman who ensured that he never wrote anything of poor quality. Above all, Yeats was a conscious artist who constantly developed, evolved, changed, and as a result, there is tremendous variety in the corpus of W.B. Yeats. The consensus among critics is that Sailing to Byzantium is one of the finest specimens of the poetry, of the poetry of W.B. Yeats. We shall begin by examining the title of the poem. The poet has titled the poem Sailing to Byzantium. It is not going to Byzantium, but sailing to Byzantium. Sailors move through water, travel through water. Why has the poet written sailing to Byzantium rather than instead of going to Byzantium? Because he has to travel by sea. In the second stanza, at the closure of the second stanza, the poet says, I have sailed the seas and come to the holy city of Byzantium. 
So sail is the appropriate term, not go. Going to Byzantium is less appropriate than sailing to Byzantium. I think that the poet has in mind not merely sea in a literal sense. He has to cross the seas, there is no doubt about it. From Ireland to, to, to what is now Turkey, he has to cross the seas in order to reach Byzantium. But the poet probably has in mind time because he is not going to Istanbul, he is going to Byzantium. So he has to cross the seas of time. He has to travel backward in time. So sailing to Byzantium, the poet has to sail across the seas in order to reach Byzantium. And here the word seas is used in a literal sense. The poet also has to sail across the seas of time because he wants to travel backward in time in order to reach Byzantium. And I would say that the sea is a very appropriate and powerful metaphor for time. When you look back the centuries, the decades, the centuries, the eons, they, they certainly form seas and what the poet intends to do is to travel across the seas from Ireland to Byzantium and also from the present to the past across the seas of time in order to reach Byzantium. Sailing to Byzantium. Byzantium is the city now known as Istanbul, the major city of Turkey. It was earlier known as Constantinople and also as Byzantium. Though it was generally known as Constantinople, the term Byzantium was sporadically used over the centuries. Byzantium was the capital of the Eastern Roman Empire. On the death of Emperor Theodosius, the Roman Empire was divided between his two sons. The Western Roman Empire, the Western provinces being ruled from Rome and the Eastern provinces being ruled from Constantinople, also known as Byzantium. Why Byzantium? Please do not think that it was a random choice. Yeats was a very well-read man and it was after years, decades of reflection, years, decades of the absorption of inputs that Yeats came to the final conclusion that Byzantium was salvation to him. Byzantium or Constantinople, now known as Istanbul, is a city, is an ancient city, is a very ancient city which straddles Europe and Asia a city which lies on either side of the Straits of Bosporus. In Byzantium, according to AIDS, as AIDS understood it, there occurred the intersection, the intersection of, the intersection of the human, the intellectual, the artistic, 
the spiritual. In Byzantium, there occurred, as each understood it, the creation of artifacts capable of withstanding the onslaught of time. In Byzantium, as each understood it, there was an effort, and a very successful effort at that, to go beyond time. The full significance of Byzantium will become clear once we complete reading the poem. A couple of words about when W.B. Yeats wrote Shedding to Byzantium. Perhaps I should have said it earlier, but better late than never. Shedding to Byzantium is one of the most important poems of W.B. Yeats. As in the case of any Yeats poem, it went through numerous drafts. It took days, weeks for the poet to reach the final version of the poem. It is a brilliant example of the vision of the philosophy of the craftsmanship of, of the maturates. It was written in September 1926, in, in 1926. It was published in the periodical Blast in 1927. And later in the collection, The Tower in 1928. In fact, it was the first poem in the tower. And the tower, you must remember, is one of the most significant collections brought out by W.B. Yeats. Let us read the poem. That is no country for old men. That is no country for old men. When I read the poem for the first time as a schoolboy, I was flummoxed. We are now accompanying the poet on his long journey from Ireland to Byzantium. But the poet says, that is no country for old men. He should have said, this is no country for old men. Or he should have said, Ireland is no country for old men. But why that? Is Byzantium no country for old men? But I think I know better. I know better now. The poet has already embarked on his journey, embarked on his voyage. He has already left that wretched country called Ireland. And sailing to Byzantium from his ship, from his ship, he points to the country he has just departed from and declares that is no country for old men. You must remember that these powerful words, this powerful declaration is made. These powerful words are spoken by a poet who merged himself completely, who merged his life completely with the life of his country by a poet 
who melted himself and became one with the soil, with the water, with the air of Ireland, who loved Ireland and was determined to live for Ireland. I feel tempted to co contrast to contrast these opening words or sailing to Byzantium with a few lines from the eighth poem towards break of day towards break of day I quote and I quote from memory I thought there is a waterfall upon Ben Bulben side that all my childhood counted dear were I to travel far and wide I could not find a thing so dear unquote. it is the same poet who declares that is no country for old men the poet now amplifies on the opening declaration the young in one another's arms birds in the trees those dying generations at their song that is the problem the poet has now become a very old man his body is no longer capable of sexual arousal as it used to be his body is no longer supple as it used to be and he finds it unbearable that young men and young women are conducting romances are involving themselves in physical relationships are experiencing sexual bliss something which is now completely beyond him as a teacher and as an old man I fully empathize with WB Yeats with the speaker in this poem as a teacher when students can conduct romances they smile at each other they hold hands at the desk they pass love notes they exchange love notes while I am teaching I find all this utterly unbearable but I forget that when I was a student myself I was doing the very same things the young in one another's arms making love how bad how mean how immoral how indecent not merely human beings even the birds birds in the trees those dying generations at their song dying generations because the poet feels that they don't leave behind anything immortal they don't make an an eternal contribution to history they are dying generations if somebody spends all his life making love and then he dies he is not going to be remembered except perhaps by his lover he is part of a dying generation at their song the song is a mating song not merely human beings everything in Ireland seems to the old man that it says 
to be involved in sexual relationships. The young in one another's arms, birds in the trees, those dying generations at their song. The salmon falls, the macro crowded seas. In fact, not merely human beings, not merely birds, even fish. They seem to be playing the same game. Salmon is a medium-sized fish which lives in the sea but which swims up rivers in order to lay eggs. It is much prized for its pink flesh. Mackerel is a predatory marine fish. It is an important food fish. The point that the poet wants to make is that everything, human beings, birds, fish, are all playing the same game of pursuing sexual ecstasy. I am reminded of the idiom, throw a sprat, throw a sprat to catch a mackerel. A sprat is a much smaller fish than a mackerel. To throw a sprat to catch a mackerel means to use something small in order to gain something bigger. To use something small as a bait in order to gain something bigger. Throw a sprat to catch a mackerel. There is a parallel saying in Tamil let me try to remember it. Mudiya Keti Malaya Iritana Pona Mudi Vanda Malay. I repeat Mudiya Keti Malaya Iritana Pona Mudi Vanda Malay. Fish, flesh, or fowl commend all summer long. Fish, flesh, or fowl, every living thing, commend all summer long. Commend means praise. Praise all summer long. What? Sexual pleasure. Sexual ecstasy, sexual bliss. Commend can also mean recommend. Present as suitable for acceptance or reward. In that sense, also, the word works here. Recommend. Recommend what? Recommend their bodies to their lovers. Commend all summer long. All living things recommend themselves, their bodies, to their lovers all summer long as suitable for involvement, for utilization in sexual exercises. Whatever is begotten, born and dies. Begotten. To beget means to become the father of. To beget means to father as a verb, to father. I'm reminded of one, two, one, two, yes, of Matthew. 
Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Judah and his brothers. Whatever is begotten, born and dies, that is the problem. The fact that existence, physical existence in this world is not permanent. Whatever is begotten, born and dies. Is there any meaning in this cycle? Is there any permanence? Is there any significance? Human existence, not merely human existence, all existence in this world is temporary, is transient, is impermanent. But the problem is that we don't comprehend this. We don't comprehend this because we are caught in that sensual music, caught in that sensual music. We become slaves, slaves to our senses. We are absolutely controlled by our senses, caught in that sensual music. We are caught in that music as in a trance. All neglect, all neglect, because we are so obsessed with the pursuit of sexual pleasure. We are so obsessed with our bodies. We are so obsessed with the physical dimension of our existence that we completely neglect. Neglect, refuse to give attention. We refuse to bestow adequate attention on monuments of unaging intellect. That is it. There are certain things which can stand the test of time. Monuments of unaging intellect. These monuments do not age. These monuments are immortal. These monuments exist eternally. Monument is any structure of importance. Unaging, which refuses to age, which remains eternally young, eternally significant, eternally important. Intellect is the faculty of reasoning, of comprehending, of analyzing, of explaining. Monuments of unaging intellect are completely neglected in that country, in that country, in Ireland. And, this, and so the poet is on his way from Ireland to Byzantium. There is a similar passage, a comparable passage, in the Sanskrit writer, in the Sanskrit poet, Bhartruhari. Let me try to remember it. This is what Bhartruhari says. I quote, Adityasya gata gatai raha raha sangshiyate jibitam vyaparai bahukarya bhara guru bhi kalo pinaknyayate drishtva janma jara vipatti maranam Trasascha notpadhyate pitva mohamayim pramada madiram unmatta budam jagata. Unquote. Adityasya gata gatai raharaha sangshiyate jivitam. The sun rises and the sun sets and life is exhausting itself. Vyaparai bahukarya bhara gurubhi 
kalopinaknyayate. Carrying out the heavy burden of the business of life, we are unaware of the fact that life is extinguishing itself. Drishtva Janma Jara Vipatti Maranam. We see, we witness Drishtva Janma Jara Vipatti Maranam. We see, we are witness to birth, old age, tragedy, and death. Trasascha Notpadyate. But that does not inspire any fear in us. Why? Though we see the reality of life at close quarters, it does not affect us in any manner. It does not inspire any fear in us. Why? Pitwa Mohamayim Pramada Madhiram Drunk with the intoxicating liquor of delusion. Unmatta Budam Chekata. The world is a wandering madman. Let us move to the second stanza. An aged man is but a paltry thing. Your tattered coat upon a stick unless soul clap its hands and sing and louder sing for every tatter in its mottled dress. An aged man is but a paltry thing. Paltry, small, meager, worthless. I think in this context it would be better to say miserable, wretched. An aged man, an old man is a wretched thing. The poet is keenly aware of the fact that his body has become old and fragile and uh, stiff and uh, is not far from death. A tattered coat upon a stick. A tattered coat, a torn coat. Tattered means in poor condition. Torn and in poor condition. A tattered coat upon a stick. I think here we have the image of the scarecrow. An old man is nothing but a scarecrow. A tattered coat upon a stick. The metaphor of the body is stress. An aged man is but a paltry thing, a tattered coat upon a stick. The tattered coat is the body. From where did WB AIDS get this metaphor? The body is stress. Obviously from the Bhagavad Gita. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna explains that death is the process by which the soul casts aside one body and then enters another body just as we cast aside dirty clothes and then put on a fresh pair of clothes. It has been recorded the WB AIDS used to conduct lengthy discussions on the Bhagavad Gita 
with Hindu religious scholars like Mohini Mohan Chatterjee. Mohini Mohan Chatterjee and Sri Purohit Swami. The poet says that an old man is nothing but a scarecrow, a tattered coat upon a stick, unless soul clap its hands and sing, and louder sing for every tatter in its mortal dress. See, the body is presented as the mortal dress. The immortal soul is subtly, indirectly contrasted with the mortal dress that is the body. The poet says that the soul of the old man, the old man is a scarecrow, the only way they overcome the condition of being a scarecrow and nothing but a scarecrow is to make the soul clap its hands and sing and louder sing for every tatter in its mortal dress the soul has to clap its hands and sing the more the dress is tattered the more the body is old the more the body is fragile the more the soul has to sing. I think that here WB AIDS is influenced, is influenced by William Blake. William Blake was a mystic and a visionary. William Blake was particularly close to his younger brother Robert to his younger brother Robert and when Robert breathed his last, when his younger brother died, William Blake, witnessing the death of his brother, said that he saw the soul of his brother ascend to heaven. It can be suggested that this vision of William Blake seeing the spirit of his brother, the soul of his brother ascending to heaven could have influenced W. B. Yeats while writing these lines. What does the poet mean when he speaks of the soul clapping its hands and singing? The poet explains this in the next two lines. Nor is there singing school, but studying monuments of its own magnificence. That is what the poet means when he talks of the, when he speaks of the soul clapping its hands and singing. Experiencing the magnificence of its own monuments. The poet is close to the point of discarding his own body. The poet realizes that he is not far from death. And the poet now wants his soul to sing. What does he mean by that? Study the monuments of its own magnificence. I would like to point out here that this is the vision of the mature AIDS. And AIDS was, as a young man, rather obsessed with the body. 
The young Aids was a poet who seemed to believe that heaven lies, that heaven lies between the breasts of women. But now we have the mature Aids who says that the body is nothing but a tattered coat and that all he desires is that his soul should clap its hands and sing. And how can the soul clap its hands and sing? By studying the monuments of its own magnificence. By immersing itself in the glory of monuments of spiritual splendor. The only way open before the poet now is to immerse himself in the glory of monuments of spiritual grandeur, spiritual splendor. And therefore I have sailed the seas and come to the holy city of Byzantium. The poet is keenly aware that it is not possible for him to do it, to do the same, do uh, what he has been describing in the preceding lines in Dublin or in London. So he has sailed the seas. And therefore I have sailed the seas and come to the holy city of Byzantium. It is not possible to, for him to immerse himself in the glory of monuments of spiritual splendor in 20th century Dublin a 20th century London. And so he has sailed the seas and come all the way to Byzantium. I have already said, the sea, the seas are not merely geographical, physical. They are also temporal. The poet does not say that he has come to Constantinople. He is not, the poet does not say that he has come to Istanbul. The poet says he has come to Byzantium. So he has crossed the seas, not merely the physical seas, but also this, the temporal seas, the seas of time. He has travelled back in time and he, he has travelled across the seas in a physical sense in order to reach not Istanbul, not Constantinople, but Byzantium. Now the question arises, why Byzantium? Okay, not Dublin, not London, but why Byzantium? Why not Rome? Why not Athens? Byzantium is another name for Constantinople. I've already explained that. Constantinople was sporadically known as Byzantium. Byzantium was the capital of the Eastern Roman Empire. While the Western Roman Empire was oriented towards Latin, the Eastern Roman Empire was oriented towards Greek. While the Western Roman Empire was oriented towards Catholicism, Catholicism, the Eastern Roman Empire was oriented towards Orthodoxy. Why Byzantium? Why not Rome? Why not Athens? The first reason is continuity. Byzantium has a continuity which Rome cannot boast of, which Athens cannot boast of. Even after the collapse of the Western Roman Empire, the Eastern Roman Empire 
continued to flourish cent century after century with Byzantium as its capital. Byzantium is both an European city and an Asian city. It lies on either side, sides of the Strait of Bosphorus, on either side of the Bosphorus Strait. And the Bosphorus Strait, you must remember, is part of the continental boundary between Europe and Asia. Byzantium is remarkable for its inclusive civilization, for its hybrid culture, for its amazing art, for its spectacular architecture. It was after much thought, much deliberation, much study, the WB8 chose Byzantium and it was certainly, it was most certainly a right choice. In among school children stanza four, in among school children stanza four, the poet calls himself old scarecrow stands of four now that old scarecrow in this poem sailing to byzantium is attempting to go beyond the limitations of his dying body, aging, dying body. And it is as part of his attempts to go beyond the limitations of his aging, dying body that the poet has traveled all the way, not only in space, not only in space, but also in time in order to reach Byzantium. In the opening stanza of or sailing to Byzantium, the poet has left Ireland. In the second stanza, he has just arrived in Byzantium. In the third stanza, he is in Byzantium, studying the magnificence of the monuments of the soul. I think that a sustained comparison can be established between the present poem, between Sailing to Byzantium by W.B. Yeats and the popular poem of Thomas Hardy, I look into my glass, I look into my glass. In the Hardy poem, the speaker looks into his glass, looks into his looking glass, looks into his mirror and is distressed and is shocked by his wrinkled skin, by the degeneration of his body, but also admits that within that body within that aging body beats a young heart, a heart which is not incapable of romantic infatuations, a heart which perhaps still very much desires physical union with woman. We now come to stanza three, which is also the penultimate stanza. O sages standing in God's holy fire, as in the gold mosaic of a wall, 
come from the holy fire pawn in a gyre and be the singing masters of my soul god's holy fire the poet is already in a magnificent byzantine church full of splendid mosaics he's looking at them and the mosaics represent the christian saints the christian martyrs god's holy fire could be an illusion to the bible could be a biblical illusion for in isaiah 6 6 7 6 6 7 the bible speaks of burning coal representing the holy fire of god standing inside the magnificent church in byzantium the poet looks at the gold wall the golden wall the wall is plastered the wall is covered with gold mosaic and there are pictures there are representations of sages standing in god's holy fire the poet exhorts the sages the poet appeals to the sages standing in god's holy fire as in the gold mosaic of a wall to come from the holy fire the sages are now high up on the wall on the gold mosaic wall enjoying spiritual ecstasy in the holy fire of god the poet appeals to them to descend from that height and be the singing masters of my soul come from the holy fire pawn in a gyre pawn means spin rotate gyre means spiral it's one of the favorite images of its you come across the image in the second coming turning and turning in the widening gyre gyre means spiral gyre means cone pawn in a gyre means spinning in a gyre the poet imagines the sages to be standing in the holy fire of god experiencing spiritual bliss not merely standing in the holy fire of god but spinning in a gyre pawn in a gyre they are spinning they are rotating in a gyre in a spiral of spiritual development of spiritual exaltation the sages are constantly being uplifted spiritually and so they are born in a gyre they are ascending through the gyre the spiritual spirals you must remember that these are upward spirals the, the sages are constantly evolving into greater and finer spiritual beings it is to these sages that the poet appeals to come come down to descend and become the singing masters of my soul to teach him 
the lessons of spiritual magnificence, to teach him the lessons of spiritual splendor, to teach him the lessons of spiritual grandeur. Consume my heart away, sick to desire, and fastened to a dying animal. It knows not what it is, and gather me into the artifice of eternity. Consume my heart away. The poet no longer wants his heart. Consume my heart away. I'm reminded of the title of one of the plays of, one of the early plays of W.P. Yeats, The Land of the Heart's Desire. The Land of the Heart's Desire. But that was the young Yeats. This is the old Yeats. Now the poet says, Consume my heart away. Destroy my heart. Eat my heart away. Sick with desire. The poet admits that the heart is sick with desire. The fact is that even when your body is aged, even when your body is dying, even when your body is fragile, even when your body is no longer supple, the heart has its desires. And the desires are certainly the desires of a very young man. Sick with desire, fastened to a dying animal. That is the problem. The heart has its romantic desires, its physical desires, its sexual desires. But the heart is attached to an animal which is dying. Earlier, the body and the heart were in sync with each other. The body and the heart were working in tandem. Now the heart continues to desire in a wild manner. Continues to desire sexual bliss in a manner which befits only the young, but the body is no longer capable of it. The body is dying, is a dying animal. A beautiful image, a powerful image. The heart, still romantic. The body, a dying animal. It knows not what it is. It knows not what it is. Gather me into the artifice of eternity. Artifice means device of eternity, of immortality. Something which goes beyond time. Gather me, take me into the device of immortality into the artifice that goes beyond time. It knows not what it is. It knows not what it is. What is this it? It knows not what it is. What is this it? It is the heart. The heart is still romantic. The heart is still enslaved by carnal desires. The heart still longs for physical union with the body of woman. The heart does not realize that it is now encased, encased in an aging body, in a dying body in a body which is no longer supple, in a body which is incapable, which is unable to, incapable of, incapable of obeying its dictates, unable to obey its dictates. It could also stand for the body. The body does not realize that it is no longer young, 
it knows not what it is. The body does not realize that. It is an old body, it's a fragile body, it's a stiff body, it's a dying body. It could also stand for the soul. It, I think that is the best explanation, though it may not appear very appropriate if you look at the context. If it stands for the soul, it is a very Indian explanation, a very Hindu explanation. Because Hindu religious literature, Indian religious literature repeatedly tells us, especially Advaita Vedanta, repeatedly tells us that we often mistake ourselves for our bodies, but we are our souls. Man identifies himself with his body. Man is not his body. Man is his soul. It knows not what it is. A typical statement from an Advaita Vedanti. It knows not what it is. The soul should become aware of its true identity. Should shed its ignorance regarding what it is. The speaker should stop identifying himself with his body and realize that he is, in fact, his soul. Now we have to identify the church, where the speaker is standing and from inside which the speaker addresses the sages standing in God's holy fire at the beginning of the penultimate stanza. I would very much like to like to speculate that the church where the speaker in the poem is standing is the Hagia Sophia. The Hagia Sophia. The Hagia Sophia. The patriarchal cathedral of Constantinople the largest and the grandest church of the Eastern Roman Empire, which was converted into a museum in 1935 and which was recently, I think it was in 2020, which was recently reopened as a mosque. Though I would like to support the candidature of the Hagia Sophia for the church from inside which the speaker in the poem addresses the sages at the opening of the penultimate stanza of the poem it is certain that a better candidate is the cathedral of Saint Apollinaire Novo. Saint Apollinaire Novo in Ravenna, in Italy. A fabulous specimen of Byzantine art and architecture. W.B. Yeats visited the cathedral in the course of his Italian tour and the cathedral made a tremendous impression on him. It has to be pointed out that there are murals 
on the inside wall of the cathedral and that the apostles and some of the saints are represented in the murals as standing in the holy fire of God. Before I move to the last answer, I would like to draw your attention to the, sh to the short poem, Death of W.B. Yeats. A comparison and perhaps also a contrast can be worked out between sailing to Byzantium and death. Death is not a, not a very popular poem, is not a frequently anthologized poem. It is a poem generally ignored by critics and commentators. But there is a lot in common between sailing to Byzantium and death. And it should be observed that in death, in death, W.B. Yeats represents a man awaiting his end, awaiting his end as a dying animal, a dying animal. The four stanza structure of the poem Sailing to Byzantium represents the four stages in the journey of the soul of the poet. In the first stanza, the poet has already left Ireland. That is no country for old men. In the second stanza, to be more specific, by the time the second stanza comes to a conclusion, he has arrived in Byzantium and therefore I have sailed the seas and come to the holy city of Byzantium. In the third stanza, he is inside a church in Byzantium and he apostrophizes the sages standing in the God's holy fire on the inside of the walls of the church. And you must remember that the sages, the apostles, the saints are individuals who have overcome the problems of the body, the problems of aging, the problems of death, unlike the speaker, unlike, unlike the poet. In the last answer, the speaker explains what he would like to be once he leaves his present body. The poet declares that once he dies, once he leaves his present body, once out of nature, he shall never take his bodily form from any natural thing. This is a clear allusion to the principle of the transmigration of the soul so integral to mainstream schools of Hindu religious philosophy like Advaita Vedanta. 
This is a concept totally unacceptable to Christianity. The fact or the the, 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 the speculation rather that the soul leaves one body and then enters another body. Be that as it may, the poet states that once he leaves this body, he will never again accept another body, another physical body. Once he accepts another physical body, he will have to go through all the stages of development, of aging, of decay that he faced in this life as a result of his soul being encased in a human body. The poet seems to believe in the theory that once he leaves this body, he will have to accept another body. And in that case, he declares categorically that he will not take another physical body. He will not allow his soul to enter another physical body, be that human or be that animal or be that avian. Once he dies, the poet shall accept as his next body the body of a gold bird singing from a gold tree. It may seem puzzling. It may seem puzzling at first sight. But it is a fact that it has been recorded that in the palace of the Byzantine Emperor there was a tree of gold. And on that tree was a bird of gold. And that the bird was capable of singing. The Byzantine civilization attained extraordinary heights of excellence in the fields of art, especially in the field of metal work. And the poet says that he shall become a bird such as the one made by Grecian goldsmiths. I have already said that there was a strong Greek element in the civilization, in the culture of the Eastern Roman Empire. You must understand that there were no nation states at that time and living in a world of nation states you may find it difficult to understand how there were Greek goldsmiths in the Byzantine goat but the fact is that they were there. The bird is made of hammered gold. Hammering was one of the methodologies used by goldsmiths at the time. Hammered gold. Gold wrought into shape as a result of hammering. Gold hammered into shape. And gold enameling. Enameling means covering. And enamel is a cover usually opaque and glossy. Sometimes the bird would not be made of solid gold. It would only be, it would only be enameled in gold to keep a drowsy emperor awake. As I said in the 
palace of the Byzantine emperor was a gold bird capable of singing from a gold tree, set on a gold tree, capable of singing. It has been recorded that the gold bird perched on the gold tree was capable of producing musical notes. There has been much speculation regarding the identity of the bird and it has been suggested the bird, that the bird is a nightingale, that the bird is a cuckoo, that the bird is a dove, that the bird is a cock. But the fact is that historical records state that the gold bird on the gold tree in the palace of the Byzantine emperor was merely a bird, nothing more, nothing less. To keep a drowsy emperor awake, when the emperor felt sleepy, when the Byzantine emperor felt sleepy, he would ask the bird to sing, and the bird would sing, and that would prevent him from going to sleep. Or sit upon a golden bough, as I said, there was a gold tree, and this gold bird was set on a bough, on a branch of the gold tree. To, or sit upon a golden bough to sing to lords and ladies of Byzantium of what is past or passing or to come. The lords and ladies of Byzantium would listen to the song of the bird like very much like the emperor himself. And the bird, remember, it's a gold bird perched in a gold tree. And the bird would sing of the past, of the present, of the future. In fact, this is, this wide canvas is the thematic universe of art. What are the contrasts in the poem is between? nature and art, between life and art. And in order, to, in order to sharpen that contrast, the poet explains that the bird sings of what is past or passing or to come. This is the subject matter of art, the past, the present and the future. The bird sings of the past, of what has happened, of what is happening and what is going to happen. It is interesting to note that W.B. Yeats wrote a sequel to Sailing to Byzantium and that the sequel is titled Byzantium. Sailing to Byzantium is about the poet leaving Ireland, moving across, across the seas of time and of course the physical seas in order to reach Byzantium. Arriving in Byzantium and apostrophizing the sages standing in the holy fire of God on the walls of the cathedral in Byzantium and of what shape he intends to take once he leaves the present body. But the poem Byzantium is about what happens to him once he starts living in Byzantium. 
the two poems sailing to Byzantium and Byzantium always go hand in hand complement each other and enrich each other I once came across a question paper in which there was the question write a short note on the theme of sailing to Byzantium I would say that that was a stupid question sailing to Byzantium is a great poem and one of the reasons why we say that it's a great poem is that it handles numerous themes it would be right to state that the thematic fabric of sailing to Byzantium is structured around a series of structured around a catena of polarities Ireland and Byzantium 20th century and 10th century youth and age body and spirit nature and art transience and eternity death and immortality let us take a look at each of them Ireland and Byzantium the poet feels that Ireland is no longer Ireland is no longer a country for him because it's not it's not a country for old men and the poet is an old man and so he decides to sail to Byzantium the contrast between Ireland and Byzantium Ireland being no longer a country for old men 20th century and 10th century the poet flees from 20th century Ireland to 10th century Byzantium the Byzantine the Byzantine Renaissance reached its peak around the 10th century so the poet tries to flee from the 20th century and go to the 10th century youth and age that is one of the important thematic strands in the poem youth caught in the sensual music youth I'm thinking of eternity youth obsessed with itself and age it is only when you reach the maturity of old age that you realize the meaninglessness the insignificance of the body of youth of sensual pleasure body and spirit a very important contrast in the poem the poet is an old man and his body is decaying undergoing degeneration moving towards extinction and the poet feels that 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 the time has come for him to focus on on the matters of the spirit and there is the contrast between the poet entangled in an aged body and the sages in God's holy fire who have transcended the, the, their bodies and become spirits nature and art 
Nothing in nature is permanent. On the other hand, art is eternal. And this contrast is heightened by the contrast between the foul in the opening stanza of the poem, foul means bird, and the bird in the last stanza of the poem, the bird in the last stanza of the poem is a bird of hammered gold. And hence, an eternal specimen of the art of Byzantium. Transience and eternity. Most of the things in this world are transient. They are prey to the limitations of time. The body, for example. Nature, for example. Birds, for example. Animals, for example. Fish, for example. On the other hand, there is eternity. A work of art is forever. A work of art has no limited time span. It is something eternal. Death and immortality. I think that's the most important thematic strand in the fabric of the poem. The poet's attempt to transcend the death of his body. The poet's realization that the death of his body is not his death in the full sense of the word. The poet's realization that his spirit is immortal. The poet's desire to live in the world of the spirit rather than in the world of the body. I would like to observe that sailing to Byzantium is a poem particularly relevant to the contemporary world because the poem speaks of the agony of old age and the contemporary world is a world completely devoid of empathy for the aged and the dying. This probably explains the remarkable popularity that sailing to Byzantium enjoys in the contemporary world. Let us now take a close look at the stylistic component of the poem. W. B. Yeats was a passionate craftsman and sailing to Byzantium is one of his finest poems from the technical point of view. It took the poet weeks of intense effort to create the poem and he was immensely he was immensely proud of it and it is sailing to Byzantium that inaugurates the tower, the tower, the most important poetry collection of W.B. Yeats. And you must remember that the tower was published in 1928. I have already pointed out 
that sailing to Byzantium has a very appropriate title. The word sailing in sailing to Byzantium means sailing across the seas in a very literal sense in order to reach Constantinople from Dublin and also sailing across the seas of time in order to reach from the island of the 20th century the Byzantium of the past maybe the 5th century or the 10th century Byzantium being another name for Constantinople the capital city of the Eastern Roman Empire the poet has chosen to leave Ireland for Byzantium to leave the Ireland of the 20th century for the Byzantium of the 5th century or the 12th or, or the 10th century because Byzantium is everything Ireland is not because Ireland is not a country for old men while Byzantium with its magnificent monuments with its magnificent artistic intellectual cultural spiritual monuments is very much a place for old men the poem is organized in four stanzas the four stanzas stand for the four stages in the journey of the poet's soul the poet uses Ottawa Rim in which each stanza consists of eight lines six lines rhyming a b a b a b and a couplet with double rhyme rhyming c c it may be pointed out that ottawa rima was first used by italian poets and that the english poets borrowed the ottawa rima from the italian poets during the renaissance the meter used is iambic pentameter this means that each line consists of five feet and that every foot consists of two syllables each foot is an iamb that is a short syllable followed by a long syllable an unstressed syllable followed by a stressed syllable the poem makes use of extremely dynamic and powerful imagery the imagery is mostly borrowed from natural life architecture and art the poet makes use of an extraordinary variety of figures of speech in sailing to Byzantium these include assonance and alliteration in assonance a vowel sound is repeated for effect 
and in alliteration a consonant sound is repeated for effect. Examples are an aged man, my bodily form from, fish, flesh or fowl, lords and ladies of Byzantium. The poet makes use of personification when he speaks of the soul clapping its hands and singing and singing in the second stanza of the poem. We meet with oxymoron in the third stanza of the poem. Sick with desire. Enjambment is the flow of meaning from one line to the next without terminal punctuation. There is enjambment in the second last stanza, in the penultimate stanza of the poem, at the close of the penultimate stanza of the poem. Gather me into the artifice of eternity. Apostrophe occurs when the poet effects a digression from the discourse and turns to address somebody or something. We meet with digression in the third stanza of the poem, at the beginning of the third stanza of the poem, O sages standing in God's holy fire, as in the gold mosaic of a wall.